Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Dr. Sarah Blosser and along with today's moderator, Dr. Priyanka Upredi, I work for Roche Diagnostics in the area of medical and scientific affairs. One of the purposes of our team is to provide education on a broad variety of topics in a non-commercial way. We've par partnered with LabRoots for a number of webinars in 2022. When we were thinking about a respiratory-based webinar, we of course thought of COVID. But what should we talk about that hadn't already been covered? Very quickly, we focused on public health, the public health laboratory specifically, and their journey as an area that really hasn't been given a very big voice to date. And so the concept for this webinar was born. Today, you'll hear from three speakers, all presenting from three different public health laboratories perspectives. We hope you enjoy these tales from the lab as we walk through the journey that the pandemic created for us. We hope you laugh with us, cry with us, mourn with us, and celebrate with us. But most of all, we hope you learn about the challenges and triumphs faced by our truly amazing public health laboratories. And with that, I'll turn it over today's, to today's moderator. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, the COVID-19 Public Health Experience. My name is Priyanka, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational webinar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Roche Diagnostics. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type, them, type the questions in the Ask the Question box and click send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I would now like to welcome our speakers for today. Our first speaker will be Dr. Alana Striegel. Dr. Striegel is currently an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the associate director for the Communicable Disease Division at the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene. Our public health lab was the first in the state to test for SARS-CoV-2 and has undergone more than 30 validations to keep it running at this point. Dr. Striegel supports the molecular testing not only in her lab, but also throughout the state. She serves as the state's subject matter expert in developing testing guidance for lab testing and is a subject matter expert for the National CSTE COVID-19 Case Definitions Workgroup. Our second speaker for today will be Dr. Wade Aldis. Dr. Aldis is, currently, is the current Senior Associate Director of the State Hygiene Laboratory at the University of Iowa, with an adjunct associate professorship in the University of Iowa College of Public Health, Department of Epidemiology. Dr. Aldis is a member of the APHL Infectious Disease Committee and the APHL Sexually Transmit Transmitted Disease Subcommittee. In Iowa, he, con he contributes to the Preparedness Advisory Committee, the Infectious Disease Steering Committee, and the Healthcare Associated Infection Advisory Group. His research interests are focused on clinical microbiology, epidemiology, and infection control, and multi-drug resistant organisms. He has authored more than 40 articles and five book chapters. Our last speaker for today will be Dr. Sarah Blosser. Dr. Blosser is currently the Molecular Scientific Liaison at Roche Diagnostics in the Division of Medical and Scientific Affairs, where she focuses on molecular diagnostics and public health. Dr. Blosser is a diplomat of ASM's American Board of Medical Microbiology. Previously, Dr. Blosser served as the Indiana Department of Health Laboratory's Director of Clinical Microbiology, where she managed the TB, ARLN, CTNG, mycology, and assay development testing groups. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she served as Indiana's, Indiana Laboratory's Testing Network Program Manager, coordinating all of the field testing for Indiana's public health-based initiatives. Dr. Blosser's research interests include assay validation, maldetoff mass spec, antimicrobial resistance, and public health. I would, I would like to now start today's presentation. Dr. Striegel, you may now begin your presentation. <laughs> 
Thanks so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be able to share the perspective of the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene and our experience with molecular testing with SARS-CoV-2. In my talk today, I'm going to be going over kind of what we went through in the early parts of the pandemic with our molecular testing and some strategies we used to keep testing and to build our capacity and stay afloat through the wave of COVID. So, I think many of us were kind of watching COVID as it first emerged in China, wondering if this was going to fizzle out like SARS had, or if it was going to grow and explode and become a large outbreak. As we saw cases really starting to explode and popping up in other parts of the world, we knew that this was real. And from very early on, we were working to see what we could do to prepare in advance for testing needs here in Wisconsin. Well, it hit us pretty early. We were one of the first states to get a positive COVID case. Uh, while someone came down with symptoms in late January, they were officially uh, diagnosed as the first case in Wisconsin in February 5th. They had recently traveled to China. Um, we spent a lot of time early on shipping additional samples from this patient to the CDC. Uh, and we really wanted to start bringing on our testing as quickly as possible. It's so much easier to just do the test ourselves. You get that faster turnaround time for your patients as well. So on February 7th, we received our first test kit from CDC and we got to work immediately. Uh, by the end of that day, on a Friday nonetheless, we already knew something wasn't quite right. With a lot of confirmatory testing by Monday, we were very certain that the verification had failed due to random false positives seen in the N3 marker. We weren't gonna be able to use this test for patients. We were pretty frustrated. The test that had been approved by the FDA as an emergency use authorization or EUA test uh, that was produced by the CDC had four different PCR markers, N1, 2, 3, and then RNP as an internal control. So that N3 marker was the one that was giving us a hard time. And it took what felt like forever uh, for the new test to come out. Unfortunately, at that time, FDA did not allow lab developed tests when an EUA was in place. There really wasn't much we could do ourselves. We had to wait for CDC to produce a new test for us to use. It wasn't until February 26th that N3 marker was officially dropped by the CDC um, and by the included with the FDA EUA and we were allowed to continue moving forward. Once again, we very quickly got through verification, and by the end of the day on Friday, we had completely uh, completed our verification. We're ready for testing for our first in-house test for SARS-CoV-2 here in Wisconsin. We officially went live on Monday accepting samples and doing patient testing, and that's when it really started getting hard. Uh, so our testing had very humble beginnings. The test that we got from the CDC um, really didn't allow for a lot of flexibility and used a lot of time and reagents. It was basically from the basic building blocks of doing a PCR tests. Nothing came really well prepackaged. So our capacity starting out was only 45 people per day, which in today's standards, it seems incredibly low. Uh, at the time, both nasal pharyngeal and oral pharyngeal swabs were required on every patient. And only the easy one extraction platform or manual extractions were really approved for this test. So with running a single easy one instrument, we could only run 14 samples per day. And with two samples per patient, that was only six and a half uh, patients per run. Uh, we could maybe fit in about seven easy one runs a day per max if we were really pushing the maximum of our day for a total of about 45 patients. Uh, Pushing this all through, it became even more complicated because we had to do three targets per specimen. So for each person tested, they had to have six PCR reactions, plus the controls that go through the extraction controls, the PCR controls also added a lot to this. The first CDC kits came with enough tests to do a thousand PCR reactions. This equated to about 155 people per kit. And we were only receiving about one kit per week. They were in really, really high demand. So if testing at our max capacity, our supplies could last us about 3.7 days. That's it. 
that's not very long. And the demand was huge. Now, thinking early on, in normal times, we would have offered this kind of test with a two to five day turnaround time from receipt in the lab, another key point, due to, you know, something uh, lives late right in the day or arrives on a weekend, then we would uh, test it the following Monday. So this kind of turnaround time was really um, not what people were looking for early on in the pandemic. And this kind of capacity, while similar to a lot of our other tests, was simply insufficient for uh, the demand that was coming up. So we had to make some really tough choices. Uh, there was a lot of demand to test everything now, a whole bunch of volume right now, and that would lead to, of course, happier customers, and we would have uh, really fast results coming out if we pushed everything through at once, or we could take a different panel and decide to do test a little bit every day. This leads to less burnout for our staff. We never stop testing if we can get reagents again before our current ones run out, and then we try to save our tests for really urgent situations, and that was the strategy we decided to go with to test a little every day, which wasn't always the most popular decision. There was an immediate massive demand for testing. Uh, it started out with questions. Um, even in February, uh, calls from labs, hospitals, organizations, all wanting to get testing. There was an immediate interest in mass routine asymptomatic screening. And there was a lot of people calling in favors and asking for special treatment for their specific uh, population that they wanted to get testing in, which was really very difficult. We had to take the entire state as a whole and try to make testing as equitable as possible. Well, questions turned into demands and demands turned into outrage. We had people who demanded we move to 24 seven testing. We're normally a nine to five weekday kind of operation here. Uh, they demanded that we take on way more samples and scale up and uh, do more with what we with what we had. But really, it was very difficult to try to communicate early on that while we got these kits from CDC that can do a thousand tests, that doesn't mean we can test a thousand people. And even if we did all the samples in one day, that means we couldn't test tomorrow. And so communicating this with our partners was a bit of a challenge. And some people went to outrage. There was continued escalation to hire and hire people within the organizations, threats of irreparably damaged relationships and long-term consequences. Despite all the threats, we really had to stick to our guns and do what we thought was best for our patients and best for the state as a whole. And then it happened. I will always remember St. Patrick's Day, uh, March 17th in 2020, because that's when things really got difficult. We had spent many, many hours communicating with our partners to explain our test limitations, that 45 tests per day doesn't mean 45 from one facility. It means 45 from the entire state. And we couldn't tell them how many they could do. And if every one of our submitters submitted one sample, it would overwhelm us. So we tried to encourage them to really prioritize symptomatic high-risk patients. And we did as much outreach as we could possibly do with phone calls, emails, meetings, webinars, lab meetings messages out to the whole state, anything we could do to get the message out that they needed to focus and prioritize their testing. Unfortunately, um, this did not stop them from sending samples. And on March 17th, we had 800 samples arrived in one day. This was 17 times greater than our current capacity for testing at that time. Now, fortunately, we've been able to get some more reagents in in that time. We could test just under 250 people. So this was really, really concerning. There was no way we were going to be able to test all of these people. And the sample volume had just increased every single day. And everything led to even more samples are going to be coming tomorrow. No matter how much we ask nicely for them to prioritize, it wasn't necessarily the case. Most of the samples we were getting were in asymptomatic people. So with no way to test everything that showed up, we had to do something. And in something no reference lab ever wants to do, we asked a national reference lab to take some of these samples. To us, it was important that whatever patient had been collected and sent to us in good faith should get some kind of result, but there was no physical possible way that we're going to be able to get through all of these samples in a reasonable amount of time. So we sent 500 samples to a reference lab. 
So this next part of my talk, I want to go into the strategies we took to try to manage. Uh, at this time, it felt like drinking from a fire hose. Way more was coming at us than we were ever going to be able to manage. And we needed to come up with strategies to make this uh, more realistic, more manageable, and for best possible patient care. So we desperately needed help. Uh, we worked with our State Department of Health and Human Services, our DHS, and they set testing criteria that allowed us to prioritize testing for symptomatic high-risk individuals. So I think people are more familiar with this today. All the people out there that could be tested, the vast majority of that is really routine asymptomatic screening. Within those difficult times where we had shut down, there was a lot of essential personnel that we didn't want getting sick, people with high-risk occupations like nurses, paramedics, uh, those in close contact with sick people, um, plenty of people out there with symptoms. We were going through a particularly high flu season at the time as well, uh, and we really just prioritized, only started accepting those at the very peak of this triangle, the high-risk symptomatic people. Um, we worked really hard to help support other labs bring up their own testing as well. Uh, this was something that was really important that while we could only test those who needed it the most, it doesn't mean that everyone else doesn't need testing. If there wasn't some value in it, we just physically could not take on all that testing ourselves. And so we worked with state partners to help um, connect with reference labs for them to support testing needs throughout the state. We supported a lot of other uh, clinical labs throughout the state as well, building reference panels for their validations, uh, doing confirmatory testing for the new assays that they developed. We put together weekly educational webinars and so much training and communication out there uh, to really help them build the state's capacity capacity for testing. And another big win for us was our collection kit manufacture and distribution. At one point during the pandemic, it was so hard to find a collection kit to swab somebody in the first place for testing that people were scavenging clinics that had been shut down. These stories of walking through these dark abandoned clinics and scavenging through drawers to try to find some scarce random collection kit for COVID testing. That was really a major limitation. So we started building these collection kits in-house ourselves. And as cases rose through those first months, um, within a week or two, we recognized that these collection kits were going to be in shortage. We started making our own. It still wasn't enough. So we partnered with other reference labs to make these kits as well. Um, uh, that diagnostic lab nearby was a huge help, as well as another local partner who was able to source those swabs, which were impossible to get. And when we had the kits, we could send them out to others. So that would not only facilitate them for testing with us, but facilitate testing for the state as a whole. This became quickly unmanageable with the demand and volume that needed to go out. And so we worked closely with the State Emergency Operations Center, the SEOC, to take over kit distribution. And they got their portal up and running around April 20, 20th, which was great timing because then FEMA started sending their relief supplies about a month later. And we already had a system in place that we could get those supplies from FEMA and get them out to clinical labs, out to people doing testing uh, as quickly as possible to really support and build capacity for the state as a whole. This was really a strategy that there was no way our little lab could take over the entire needs of the state, but building a team and working statewide approach to build that capacity was really our focus that allowed Wisconsin to get the testing it needed. Shout out to our key labs early on that helped with that. Um, altogether, we've now distributed more than 70 million items and it keeps going. There's still a demand today. So another problem that we dealt with was managing our reagent shortages. Now, this was a real problem because this test was kind of build your own, right? It wasn't all prepackaged like getting cookie dough. So we used the cookie reference uh, metaphor to help explain to our partners what our reagent shortages really meant. Uh, if you don't have eggs, if you don't have sugar, you're not going to be making a batch of cookies. And each one of those items that were short at different times and were different bottlenecks that came up. So we did daily monitoring of our testing supplies to know how many tests we could run at any given time. And one of our big successes was we traded with other labs. 
uh, was something uh, a lab that was using the same extraction platform as us had more plastics than liquids and we had more liquids than plastics and so we traded on a couple occasions and both of us were allowed to, to were able to continue testing for a little bit longer we also had donations from researchers at the university campus and borrowed from others and really worked to uh, get supplies from wherever we could when they were really unavailable and hard to find and we diversified our testing. That was one of our biggest strategies to allow us to keep going. When the supplies were unavailable for one test type, we switched to a different test type and had multiple test types running at once. And I'll talk about that more in a moment. We did a lot of cross training as well early on in the pandemic, right around that March, April timeframe. We saw a incredible increase in the amount of our virology testing really due to SARS-CoV-2 testing that came up. Uh, in comparison to the, our standard volume in our uh, lab, that was really huge. Um, with the lockdown and everything happening, uh, a lot of our testing dropped off pretty dramatically in late March, April, and May. We had very low volumes for other tests. So instead of having one team of our virologists doing massive amounts of work and everyone sitting around twiddling their thumbs, we cross-trained as much as possible. And it was all hands on deck. We developed a COVID surge team, and this really helped when one day a huge volume of tests could come in. We could pull from other teams to get through those samples, to get a reasonable turnaround time and get through those volumes. We trained people outside of our department and borrowed space from other parts because just like we had seen a dip in our testing, other parts within the state lab outside of communicable diseases also saw dips in testing. And so we pulled from whatever resource we really could to uh, expand our testing capacity. I do want to point out here just how big of a difference that really is in our SARS-CoV-2 testing compared to all of our other testing. Our public health lab is really not built for these huge volumes of testing. Um, this picture shows our virology uh, laboratory. You can see just how small it really is. And when we tried to fit a whole bunch of people into it to do the testing, it was elbow to elbow and it got hot and uncomfortable, particularly because they had to wear enhanced PPE. Uh, we're connected with the University of Wisconsin, who has a pretty strict biosafety program uh, that said that if somebody had handled a leaking specimen without wearing respiratory protection, they were considered exposed and would potentially have to quarantine uh, for, the, you know, 14 days during that time. And taking a worker away during this time, peak time was just not something we could accept. So we had all of our staff wearing enhanced respiratory protection um, in case there was a leaker um, that they wouldn't have to go into quarantine, we wouldn't lose all of our staff to that. And certainly we don't want any of them getting sick either. Uh, and unfortunately we saw at least one leaker every day. Uh, for those who have done this testing, it was, it was amazing. We had submitters from places that we've never had submitters before. And every kind of leaking issue from misthreaded caps to people who had shoved the entire swab in a tube and screwed it on effectively spring loading the caps for when we opened them, we got a, a nasty surprise. So we had to take some extra precautions to really stay safe in the lab when handling these kinds of specimens. Our staff worked long hours and weekends. We had the crowded working space. It was very repetitive work. And we ended up having pretty high turnover. About half the people in this picture alone um, are no longer in the lab. They've moved on to other positions. And so we've been hiring new people and training uh, through all of this as well and doing what we can to continue to support this testing. I talked before about diversifying our testing, and this was really a key part to allowing us to keep testing over time. Starting with those manual extractions and the easy one, really the capacity just could not keep up with the demand. So as soon as the restrictions were relaxed a little bit and uh, CDC started adding other platforms, we really worked with that as best we could. We first moved into existing ex extraction platforms we had in-house, the MagnaPure and the EMAG both helped to expand our capacity quite a bit. Uh, and then we got our first King Picture Flex on loan from our vet diagnostic lab. So thank you so much, WDL. You were really a wonderful, wonderful help for us. Uh, so we got, I think, up to 
five king fixtures at one time, uh, expanded further into the Kaya cube. And so we had multiple platforms running at any given time. So if we ran out of reagents for the EMAG, which happened quite frequently, we could do work out with the King Fisher, the Kaya cube. And so it was a diversification, everything running at once, all hands on deck. And we did eventually get <clears throat> a couple of Panthers as well. Fortunately, we already had an order in place. We were already planning to move to the Panthers. These systems are, are really nice because it's very hands off, the extraction, the amplification detection are all in one instrument. You can walk away after loading it, leave it loaded overnight, and we'll keep running and report the results out in the morning. Um, so this helped to build our capacity as well, uh, with about 300 samples per day on a panther. Surrounding all of these together, we were able to really uh, manage the huge volumes that continued to come in despite having our testing focused on high risk symptomatic people. Uh, we still got very, very high volumes for our small lab. So in our lab, it was diversify or die. Overall, we've done more than 30 validation, verifications, and bridging studies for SARS-CoV-2. This is everything from those different extraction platform testing methods that we talked about to different test kits from different suppliers, different specimen types, different collection kits that we had to diversify because they were so hard to get, uh, including PBS, homemade versus commercial. We also did some testing with different types of storage times and extensions. Uh, the the 72 hours at four degree original rule for this test was simply um, not possible for some of our more remote locations. They just couldn't get us samples in time. And so we had to do some extension studies uh, to find that these uh, specimens were still acceptable after longer periods of time. We also worked on sequencing as well. This really became a high priority focus for us as the capacity for the state uh, increased and there was more uh, alternate locations to do COVID testing. We could really focus using our uh, resources and uh, experience on sequencing to do the variant surveillance, which has been a really powerful tool. So we've expanded and done additional validations and testing with uh, high throughput liquid handlers. I have some here on the top. Um, we moved from a MySeq to a seek to try to expand our additional uh, sequencing capacity, the min-ion to the grid-ion, anything we could do to grow and expand our sequencing capacity as we're doing a lot of that for the state. Another strategy we took was we got a lot of questions about data, up-to-date data, what's going on right now, and a lot of demand for that. Our lead bioinformatician, Kelsey Florick, built this wonderful data dashboard for our sequencing data so people could go online in real time, see what those results were, and they weren't calling us all the time to get those results. This has been a really useful tool to get the information out to those who need it uh, and take some of the burden off inside the lab of uh, sharing that information as the questions came in. We also worked closely with DHS to build a survey. So if you're not aware, the Wisconsin Clinical Laboratory Network is one of the big successes of our public health system. The public health lab is very uh, closely connected with our clinical labs here. And this allowed us to communicate information in real time and to collect information in real time. So early on, we built this lab capacity survey, a real-time survey people could update as they went. And this helped us to see uh, what, how many labs in the state were testing or were planning to test. Uh, this looked at our total capacity over time and we could see it increasing. So this told us that uh, our efforts are working or where we might need to put more efforts into building capacity. We could see what instruments that they were using. The Gene Expert was the most popular uh, here in Wisconsin from very early on, but was also one of the hardest reagents to get. Uh, and this was a really key part as well. We collected data on what kinds of shortages there were as well. This not only helped us to learn about what tests we might want to do at the public health labs. We didn't compete for supplies with the clinical laboratories, um, so we stayed away from the gene expert there in the end, didn't end up using that for ourselves so that there would be more tests available for the clinical labs who needed that really fast turnaround time. And it also helped us to work to advocate for the state. We got letters written from the governor uh, connected with manufacturers uh, with the entire state's information behind him saying the, the state of Wisconsin needs these tests and tried to advocate on a higher level to bring uh, supplies to help everyone in the state and build up our capacity. So we could see um, how many labs had shortages, how severe those shortages are, if they were um, going, if they had already had to stop testing due to a shortage or uh, pending shortage, uh, stopping testing soon too. 
So altogether, everything that we did, we tried so many strategies, but really a lot of things that were really key in helping us to continue testing and to continue to maintain a reasonable turnaround time was really diversification of our test methods, cross-training and building our COVID search team and supporting other labs to bring on testing. This effort was way more than any single lab could ever handle. And that communication and collaboration with others was really key for this. One of the outcomes from our efforts is we maintained a 48 hour turnaround time through this entire part of the pandemic, except for that, that first 800 samples. That was our only time we weren't there. And we never stopped testing. Even though we had these supply shortages, we were always testing every single day. And we helped to bring up the statewide capacity to more than 60,000 tests per day when they'll survey last checked, and even more now that we've connected with a lot of national reference centers as well. So really these external par partnerships have strengthened Wisconsin's response to pandemic and have been a, a key part in our public health response. Uh, so with that, uh, hopefully I didn't take up all my time here. I'm going to pass this on to the next person. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Wade Aldis. I'm one of the associate directors at the State Hygienic Laboratory working at our facility in Iowa City. I'm going to be presenting some information regarding COVID serology testing that we've performed over a two-year period since the pandemic began. A lot has already been discussed about people's COVID experiences, so I'm only going to focus on some of the reasons why we decided to bring on serology testing. We had discussions with several groups, our state public health department, local providers, and the local blood donor facilities. The Iowa Department of Public Health was interested in testing to support several Iowa businesses. And one of the largest employers in the state is Tyson Foods with several food production plants throughout the state. This was where some of the earliest outbreaks occurred on the processing lines. So SHL performed a lot of testing for them during the early stages of the pandemic. Over one weekend, for example, we received 5,000 nasopharyngeal swabs for PCR tests and 1,500 serology samples to perform testing. Local providers were anxious to perform testing on specific patients. And finally, the blood donors facilities were gearing up to recruit potential convalescent plasma donors. And these are the three main facilities that we perform testing for. When we first began, we had to put out some ground rules for testing because we were afraid that we might get overrun with specimens. And as you can see here, the first two criteria still hold true today. COVID serology testing was never meant to be diagnostic in nature, but rather to assist with diagnosis by combining these results with the results of other tests, mainly PCR. The first criteria to help confirm whether a person truly has been infected to help determine quarantine status or, or disposition. The second criteria to identify potential convalescent plasma donors was our main reason to, for performing testing. As for the third criteria, at the time, there was little to no knowledge about the pathology of a COVID infection. So being able to prove that essential workers had recovered and developed antibodies gave providers confidence that these individuals could return to work without fear of infecting naive individuals. We recognized the need to perform testing in bin March 2020, but at the time there were no FDA emergency use authorizations for any kits. There were several assays in development, but with undetermined availability. Our testing choices would be limited to the existing instrumentation in our lab. We had an Abbott architect for testing for HIV and the viral hepatitis and two Beckman Coulter DXI instruments, which we use for maternal screening. The third option would be to run a manual ELISA. Now, obviously, since antibody assays for SARS-CoV-2 didn't exist prior, we had several concerns regarding testing. There were no available reference materials or a gold standard to compare the new tests against, and limited knowledge of the virus pathology regarding length of immunity. There was also concern that there might be cross-reactivity with circulating coronaviruses and perhaps issues with other conditions, namely autoimmune disease. Looking at the kit inserts of the assays that we brought on, they all put in a clause about false positives, and thus they all recommended confirmation of positive results with a second assay. So the only kit that we were actually able to acquire uh, were the Euroimmune IgA and IgG assays. 
the IGA was developed as an alternative for IgM testing. IgA is associated with secretions and plays a role in mucosal membrane immune function. We began testing in early April on our test validation. And working with our colleagues from the blood donor centers, they provided us with serum samples for patients who claimed to have had COVID. We quickly determined that unless they had a known PCR positive result, many of these individuals had negative serologies. The donor centers then focused specifically on recruiting confirmed positive patients, which resulted in positive IgG results. Because most of our testing was performed on serum from recovered patients, we mainly just performed IgG testing. And once an individual had a confirmed positive result, the donor centers kept them on their recruiting lists so that they could donate future units. Over the next few months, we could see a pattern of a slow downward trend on those signal to cutoff values, similar to what was noticed in this early published paper from Finland, where they ran multiple sequential serum samples on the first noted COVID case in the country. In mid-April, the first assays with FDA emergency use authorizations became available, so we began validating other tests that we could use on our existing instrumentation. While all clinical facilities were struggling to find available reagents and consumables, we realized that we would need to have redundant testing methods to ensure that we would be able to continue testing for our clients. And now a little more than two years down the road, many laboratorians probably still have some PTSD from their COVID testing experiences. Public health labs were not immune to this either, but in retrospect, I'd like to say that there was a little bit of a silver lining from this overall experience for us because the testing began as the testing began to ex exponentially increase we got a lot of support from the federal government by the way of cdc funds to help us purchase some new instruments and testing reagents to meet those testing demands my staff had been looking at the dsor and liaison instrument as a potential replacement for our aging architect instrument so we were able to purchase one and we also realized that we needed to establish several high dollar contracts as a way to ensure that we would always have testing capabilities. Now, a little bit of information regarding COVID serology assays. There are three different immunoglobulin assays, IgG, IgM, and IgA, along with the total IgG, IgM assay. They detect mainly binding antibodies, but some are known to actually detect neutralizing antibodies. And there are two main antigenic targets, the nucleocapsid and the spike protein. Here you can see the different methods, types of results, units, and overall interpretations. One thing that's important to note is that only those assays that target the nucleocapsid can distinguish whether an individual was truly infected since the available COVID vaccines are designed against the spike protein. And these are the different testing methods that we validated. After we had two validated assays, we began to perform orthogonal testing, specifically for the blood donor specimens. We used either the Abbott or the Beckman Coulter assays for screening purposes. And if positive, we reflexed to the Euroimmune or the Diasorin assays. Because the Euroimmune was a manual assay, my staff was very excited to replace it with the Diasorin assays. First, the S1, S2 IgG assay, and now currently with the trimeric S IgG assay. So we began testing in April 2020, mostly to support the blood donor centers to recruit donors for convalescent units. We reported the signal to cutoff ratios and interpretations of the assays to the donor centers to help them identify those units that could be used for donations. This information was shared with the FDA which led to the determination of high titer concentrations to improve treatment effectiveness until monoclonal antibody therapeutics became more mainstream. In November, the LifeServe Blood Center asked if we would perform testing on all blood donors instead of just confirm PCR positive recovered patients as an incentive to increase the number of donors. And as you can see here, these graphs show the monthly average number of tests performed and the zero prevalence over time. When LifeServe stopped active collections of plasma in March 2021, they had stockpiled over 20,000 high titer units for distribution across the state and for other states in need. 
we continued to perform testing for them until the end of December 2021 with roughly 250,000 specimens tested overall. So one of the benefits of the pandemic was that it increased the overall number of potential donors. There was a dramatic increase in the number of first time donors, as well as a large number of individuals that kept returning to donate again and again. And this map on the right, generated by our colleagues at the LifeServe Blood Donor Center, indicates the location of many of the COVID serology positive donors. I'd like to close this topic with some commentary from some of my colleagues from the Clin Micronet list server. They asked the question, is there a role for antibody testing for SARS-CoV-2? The answer is yes. We helped the blood donor centers identify thousands of potential donors for convalescent plasma. And based on current FDA guidance, thousands of the specimens could have been labeled high titer for treatment. We were also able to look at the data for seroprevalence studies. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there is a high seroprevalence rate in the state of Iowa. And because we have test values on multiple repeat donors, I currently have a biostatistics graduate student looking to determine the duration of immunity caused by natural infection, vaccination, or hybrid by performing survival analysis. A final role would be to monitor immune responses to COVID vaccine candidates, which we are not participating in. When this paper was published in August 2020, the idea of performing COVID serology at a population level to guide return to work decisions or to restart the economy was a topic of widespread discussion, but it was felt that things were inconclusive then. We fast forward now to April 2022, and there's a new question regarding immunity to SARS-CoV-2. What do we know, and should we be testing for it? Questions such as, am I immune, or how long does immunity last, or what is better, vaccine or infection-induced immunity? And why aren't we testing for immunity? These continue to be raised still. The problem is that all of these serology assays were meant for determining infection status and not immune status. Thus, there is a push to identify a correlate of protection to help us better understand protective immunity against a specific disease. For SARS-CoV-2, there is not an established COP yet because there is a need to standardize these serology assays against an international standard. Numerous articles indicate that seropositivity significantly decreases the risk of infection compared to seronegativity. Protection is estimated to be around six months, but that will most likely be variant dependent. And we also recognize that vaccination and hybrid immunity, meaning those naturally infected individuals that get vaccinated, have a more enduring high titer level compared to individuals with natural immunity only. We've seen this in our own data set. But the question still remains, whether infection-induced, vaccine-elicited, or hybrid immunity, how long does protection for disease or infection last? Well, it reminds me of the Tootsie Pop commercial I used to see on Saturday mornings with the wise Mr. Owl telling that kid, how long does it take to get to the bottom of a Tootsie Roll Tootsie Pop? We may never know. But we do know that routine testing is still not recommended. The nucleocapsid target is needed to distinguish a natural infection from vaccination. And finally, with the current Omicron variant's known resistance against many current monoclonal therapies, it has been suggested that recently collected high titer convalescent plasma may prove useful in reducing the spread of disease. Finally, I just wanna say thanks to all of our public health heroes across the country and thank you for listening in today. Hey, I'm Sarah Blosser, and for the first 16 months of the COVID-19 pandemic, I served as the Indiana Lab Testing Network Program Manager, bringing together testing resources and Hoosiers to serve public health needs outside of the public health lab. Today, I'm going to tell you that story. First, I have to start with a disclaimer. I joined Roche Diagnostics in May of 2021, where I continue to serve public health by providing education about public health priorities and initiatives. As a current Roche employee, however, I want to stress that the information I share with you today is based on my personal previous experience while I worked at the Indiana Department of Health. The opinions expressed in this presentation, therefore, don't necessarily represent the views of Roche Diagnostics. <laughs> 
So today I'm gonna to talk about Indiana's approach to bringing testing closer to people through near patient testing. And these approaches require an immense cooperation between some really unconventional partners. But what we learned was maybe this pandemic has something to teach us. Maybe these partnerships aren't as unconventional as they once were because these partnerships allowed us to identify and address problems in a time frame that we had never used before. So here are five examples of how this was done in the state of Indiana. The first approach was to make testing more available for at-risk and underserved populations. And these were primarily locations such as federally qualified healthcare centers, rural locations, and prisons. And this was early on in the pandemic where testing was really mostly available in sites that had access to large hospitals or reference labs. And so we really needed to make sure that these at-risk individuals also had access to testing. And how we did that was by deploying 35 ID Now point of care PCR instruments. And you can see a picture of those in the lower right hand corner of my screen. We then distributed testing kits to sites weekly based on availability and usage. One thing I'm gonna talk about pretty consistently is the challenge we faced on how to facilitate reporting for sites that weren't always hooked into the state reporting system. If you'll recall, there was a large number of requirements for um, reporting to the state so that we could track cases. And so really some creative solutions were developed for this during the pandemic. One of the first ones that we did was to utilize REDCap for individual patient reporting. And you can see a copy of what that would look like in the upper right-hand corner of my screen. And this allowed for providers on a web-based portal to report in the results of the testing. So as the weekly kit allotments were shipped to the Indiana Public Health Lab, the next hurdle became distribution logistics for those 35 sites. So our lab preparedness director worked really closely with our um, Department of Health Logistics team to facilitate these as deliveries initially. And towards the end of this program, our Department of Health Lab container group was able to then actually begin to rebox and reship these in a timely fashion. So the next approach that we took was to drastically increase the physical locations for PCR specimen collection throughout the state. And our goal was to have specimen collection available in every county. And this approach included mobilization of both local health departments and partnership with a company called OptumServe to rapidly increase the patient facing component of this test. And if you look in the, at the map in the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the blue icons where we eventually ended up having our sites. And if you look at the population and distribution in Indiana, these mirror it pretty closely. So then we had to figure out how to get supplies to each of the locations. So they needed PPE, swabs, et cetera, in order to run these. So we partnered with a logistics company. Then we had to figure out how to get the specimen from the collection sites to testing laboratories. And Indiana is a state that does not have an existing courier system for its Department of Health Lab. So this was just one of the major features that was required to operationalize this approach. Once those pieces were figured out, laboratory testing was performed by a network of laboratories, including the Indiana State Department of Health Laboratory. Also included in this network were several clinical labs, and some research labs who obtained CLIA certification and onboarded COVID PCR testing for specifically for this initiative. So again, I'm gonna talk about the, the IT part of things because another major consideration when you're scaling specimen collection to be nearer to patients is figuring out how they're gonna have a test requisition, how they're gonna record results and how the patient's going to receive um, a record and have that record sent into the state for reporting requirements. So we tried several different methods, we tried paper, we tried red cap, and ultimately we partnered with a software company called Zotec to develop a mobile application and web-based portal. This interface allowed for patients to schedule a testing appointment online and pre-enter their requisition paperwork. And you can see an example of that in the icon with the number one. Once on site, staff could check the patient in confirm demographic, which you can see in number two, and then print a specimen label, number three. Once the specimen was collected, the test order then flowed into the lab testing network interface, 
and was assigned to a destination laboratory where it showed up in the lab's pending queue. And I don't have time to talk about this today, but that involved a lot of really nifty IT solutions that were developed during this pandemic. So once at the laboratory, the specimen would be tested, the lab would release the result, and the result would flow back to Zotech. Zotech would then send a text message to the patient, number four on the screen. Initially, this was the only way for a patient to receive their result outside of calling our state call center. So you can imagine how busy that call center was. So later on in the pandemic, a patient results portal, number five, was established. And this allowed for patients to look up their results and also the ability for them to print a physical report if they needed it. So once we had specimen collection for PCR established, the third approach was really to take point of care testing or also known as rapid testing into those same locations. And so if you look at the map, the sites that eventually had this point of care testing were have the orange pin on them. And the goal of this program was to distribute Binax Now rapid antigen tests to our local health department collection sites. But that's easier said than done. So here I'm recreating for you my thought process when I was given this directive by our chief medical officer. My first thought was, oh, that's an awesome idea. My next thought was, wait, this is a CLIA wave test. That means that these sites have to operate underneath a CLIA waiver. And then my third thought was, oh goodness, how are we going to implement this? So for those of you who weren't intimately involved with this during the pandemic, the issues surrounded mass distribution and publicity of those rapid antigen tests during a time when testing resources were extremely limited. And some individuals with very high visibility were endorsing their use in a myriad of settings, including schools and high density workplaces. The problem was that the test had been approved as a CLIA wave device, which requires that the testing location be certified to perform that testing. It also requires that they have certain documentation and training procedures for staff. They have performance procedures for testing, and then they have a mechanism for reporting. And they have to record all that in light of being inspected for that CLIA waiver. To top it all off, those of us that live in Indiana, had heard that this resource, these rapid tests would be soon available and they were not in the most patient frame of mind. So what did we do? Well, our preparedness director who was quarterbacking the entire COVID response for the state applied for her own CLIA waiver. She then allowed that waiver to be used only for Binax antigen testing for a select number of sites and for a limited duration. First, to use this mechanism were the local health departments and our Department of Corrections or prison system. Later in the pandemic, this mechanism was also used to bring up Binax testing in jails, schools, and in drug and rehab facilities. But that still left training, documentation, and reporting requirements that were required to deploy a CLIA wave antigen test. And so for training, our issue is that we needed to quickly disseminate training throughout the state. So we needed to develop a centralized training. We started with a quick start guide with some basic instructions. Watch some videos, read the package insert, take a training quiz, perform a positive and negative QC test, and then document your training. And I'm not gonna show you all the pieces here, but I can say that some of the biggest pieces of concern in the public health community was on this documentation component. So here's two examples of what we did. One was a certification of Binax Now training that each site needed to maintain on site in case of inspection. And the other one was an acknowledgement of responsibilities because we needed sites to understand that this was being done in a way that required um, them to have deep consideration and documentation uh, for the purposes of this testing program. From there, we worked to teach labs to fish, so to speak by helping them to obtain their own CLIA waivers and operate testing independently at their site. To help this, we ended up creating an application package, which included some background information, a preparation checklist, and a guide to help them fill out the waiver application. Armed with these materials, we then worked to approach non-traditional sites to offer CLIA wave testing at their facilities. And three areas of focus were homeless shelters, congregate care homes for individuals with disabilities, and K-12 schools. 
This continued our approach of teaching Amanda fish, or as I often describe during that time, teaching folks to make box mac and cheese. I actually became known as the mac and cheese lady. We created videos to demonstrate the patient interaction, as you can see here in the upper left-hand corner, infographics to indicate what supplies were needed for testing, and how that testing workflow might proceed. We also did in-person train the trainer sessions. One of my more memorable experiences was training the Indiana National Guard. Once trained, the National Guard could be asked to go to K-12 schools to help train on-site staff for the requirements and logistics of testing. Their goal was to spend half a day per site helping the school set up an optimal testing workflow in their location and to help the school staff feel confident in their ability to perform testing for their students. And you can see here in the bottom left-hand photo, all the way to the left is Dr. Box, our health commissioner. So when I think back on these efforts, those five mechanisms I showed you, I can't help but be proud of the tremendous, superb effort on the part of all of our partners to rapidly scale testing for the pandemic response. Our teams were asked daily to pull rabbits out of hats, so to speak, to test people for a disease we've never seen before all while under tremendous pressure. Today, I've touched on only some of the ways that our health department sought to increase testing availability throughout the state of Indiana. I don't have time to cover the testing efforts in long-term care facilities, mobile testing clinics, high-density workplace initiatives, university services, or the countless ways the health department worked behind the scenes to supply PPE, food, ventilators, staffing, and so much more on a daily basis. These folks stood up and they continue to every day to squeeze one more thing out of a system that was truly never designed to handle a pandemic of this magnitude. And for that, I say thank you. So I started my talk by mentioning unconventional partnerships, the odd couples that made near patient testing available in Indiana during the pandemic. Now I'll leave you with this. Are they truly that odd? Or maybe they represent a vision for the future. I'll let you decide. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aldis, Dr. Strickle, and Dr. Blosser for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask the Question box that's located in the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for today. So let's get started with our first question. Based on the COVID-19 pandemic experience, how prepared do you feel your lab is for the next pandemic? Any any of your first speakers want to take a first stab on this question? I can give that one a try. Um, I'd say a little more prepared, um, still not perfectly prepared. You know, at this scale, this volume, I feel like we've got a little bit more of a playbook of what we would do next time, uh, but every pathogen is a little bit different how you would handle it. And I think that there's really, the uh, public health as a whole does not have the capacity to do massive full public health testing on the scale that we saw with COVID, uh, really utilizing those strategies and our partners in the clinical and reference lab world um, is, is going to be key in the future. I don't see how public health can ever uh, meet the demand for, for this kind of testing uh, in the future. You know, I think I would actually agree with you there as well. The only thing I would add is basically uh, you can never be too prepared and don't ever get comfortable. Dr. Blosser, anything to add to that? I'm going to defer. Okay. All right. All right, so our next question is, what pros and cons did you have with the AVID ID Now instrument? I'm gonna let anybody answer that one, even though I spoke spoke on it. Uh, Alana Wade, any of you wanna chime in? <clears throat> well, we, we, uh, we were given 20 of those instruments to distribute throughout our state, and all I can tell you is we shipped out a lot of kits to a lot of people, and then we ended up 
with some people saying, um, we're done now because we want to do something else. Mm -hmm. And they actually wanted to take, wanted us to take the instrument back. So we said, okay, fine, we'll send it to someone else who needs it. But these were ones that were actually identified by our, uh, our state public health department of where they wanted to have these locations to be. But they, they, uh, they were great systems to use. It's just, the hard part, I think, for us was getting those results back to the mm -hmm. health department to get them reported. Yeah, I'll concur on that one. So there's no automatic interfacing. So you have to have a mechanism to put the results into the, into the system one way or another. So we actually used a paper requisition many times, and then they would go and transcribe it into that REDCap system. So mm -hmm. um, definitely something to think about in the future. It's great to have point of care. Uh, PCR thing, um, but at the same time, that's definitely a need for um, for reporting and for for you know the patient component of things. Alana, oh, I think that you've hit on most of those. We certainly had some issues early on. It was great that they were available early, um, but they were certainly a lot more complicated than some of our later versions of point of care tests. And uh, we had a lot of concerns about. Uh, safety issues associated with them and proper training. I think it took a lot more oversight to get those up and running and some of the other test methods, but um, overall, glad we had those early. All right, thank you for that. So we have time for one last question. Uh, so if you were to work on a pandemic handbook at this time, what would be the top three items you would focus on? And because of the you know time limitation, time limitation, maybe only one of you can take a stab on this. Um, well, I, I will try and take that if no one else does. Uh, but I think uh, everybody has made this comment uh, previously, and that is to make sure that you have enough staff uh, cross trained to be able to perform multiple functions throughout your site. The other biggest important thing for us, especially with this one, had to do with our supply chain and recognizing that we needed to have multiple options to be able to respond to the testing. Uh, I think everybody pretty much had to have at least plan A, B, C, D, all the way to Z, double A, whatever, so that you could at least make sure you had continuing testing capability throughout. But that's that was the hard part. That and of course all the documentation that goes along with that because during all of this process, everybody gets inspected by their regulatory agencies. I'm going to throw in real fast automation and workflow. And I think that's something mm -hmm. that we really learned a lot about and still have a lot to learn. I'm uh, probably repeating myself here, but um, work early and often with your partners and really strong communication. Um, certainly we, we can't do this in a, in a bubble here. We have to all work together to have a full public health response. Um, and the other key one I'll never forget is don't forget about the collection kits. <laughs> I think everyone always forgets about those and they sneak up on you. All right, thank you everyone for that. So thank you again, Dr. Circle, Dr. Aldis, and Dr. Blosser for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Rush Diagnostics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for the interesting questions. Questions we did not have time to answer today and those that were submitted during the on-demand period would be, will be addressed by the speakers by the contact information you provided at the time of the registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you by email when it's available for replay. So we encourage you to share that, that email with your colleagues who may have uh, missed the live event today. And with that, I would like to close today's session by thanking all the speakers and also thanking the audience for joining today. Thank you. Bye.